County. Um, we also broilers on a limited basis. And my background has been in ag, uh, so Brad almost touched on everything that I, I do also, but probably done a few more years of Brad. Um, but it's been here. And done big, big ranching work on ranch uh, externship from uh, warm livestock. We had a million six hundred thousand acres at sixty four thousand head of mother ewes, seven thousand head of cows. Uh, looking forward for them for a few years. And so, you know, if you have any questions on large or small scale, we hopefully can help you out. Is there Eric? Can you introduce ourselves? Yeah. Sorry, it's so long to get there. When you put on a conference and you have very few people, everybody wears multiple hats, and I'm an AV computer guy and had a problem over there, so sorry for the delay. I'm Eric Dickerson. Um, I was a general manager for Peaceful Valley Farm and Garden Supply for a few years, and I quit that gig to, uh, my wife and I bought a home, five acre homestead, and I wanted to take some time to set up all the infrastructure that I wanted on my homestead and get all that set up. And uh, we run chickens, about 30 to 40 chickens, depending on the time of year, for eggs mostly. Uh, we run about 20 goats right now for dairy and meat. We have two horses for our horseback riding pleasure, mostly, and their manure. And um, we have a livestock guardian dog, and then we have a couple barn cats. And what we're doing is mostly uh, food production for our own use and that of our neighbors and friends. I grew for um, the Briar Patch a couple of small specialty crops to them. Uh, so those of you that are not in the area, it's a local food co-op here that supports local farmers. Um, what else? I try to integrate all my all my inputs and all my animals and all their waste into a closed loop system. I try not to bring in uh, nutrients from outside as much as I can. Um, I don't know if you guys went over it already, but our goal with this workshop is one of the pieces of feedback that we've gotten in past years is more question and answer sessions, less talking at us. So I hope you brought your uh, your questions with you. If we run out of questions, we'll. Um, We'll just start making up stuff for things. <laughs> yeah. One of my questions is if I raise, um, say, something small like chickens for food, and I'm only on an acre, what do you do with all the innards? Um, they're great in the compost. If you have a really active compost pile, they're they're great for that. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. So the question was, um, if we raise uh, livestock or uh, chickens, a small batch of chickens for meat on our property, uh, what do we do with all the innards after it's done? So you can compost them, it's great for that. I feed it to my livestock guardian dogs as well. They're able to digest that stuff. Do you feed it to who? My livestock guardian dogs. The oh dogs that I have that guard my uh, my livestock. You guys have any other ideas? Feed it to pigs. Feed it to the pigs. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Now, if you raise some chickens for me, but you don't want to butcher them yourself, uh -huh. how do you find a good local butcher? I know from If you're raising chickens for me and you don't want to butcher them yourself, how do you process them? <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys are pointing at each other. Yeah. Because we're, Rob, we're working on a partnership where we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Rob and I both get asked that probably a handful of times a year. Uh, can you process our chickens? Or uh, more likely is... But the question I the question I get a lot is if you're processing chickens, I'll bring you over five and I'll help you out. <laughs> and uh, it, I, we're both probably pretty efficient. And I know I've helped Rob. Rob's helped me. Uh, but how do you find a butcher? Say if there you is want not, to... as far as I know, there is not a local butcher that will do chickens for you. Okay, but there is for. It's easy enough to do. There is a mobile poultry processing trailer that you can use yourself. The best way to do that, if you're raising five or ten chickens or twenty-five chickens. Do it with the, my recommendation is do it with some friends of yours that are interested in the same thing. And all of you get together on a Saturday and rent a trailer together and everybody just put in a long day and everybody chip in and do it together. And Rob's got more feedback on or more ideas on that. He does. Yeah, we're the manager, Patty, uh, and myself are the manager that uh, is now the Nevada County, Nevada County Grown Mobile Processing Trailer, which is now sitting right out back here if someone wants to go look at it after we're done. Um, but yeah, like Brad said, if you have small numbers, co-op with somebody, buy your chickens together, you know, um, go in partnership with 
everybody, you know, you raise five or ten, you raise five or ten, but buy your stuff together so you save costs and everything. So you also process at the same time so you can get four or five uh, families to do it. Uh, big family down in uh, Auburn, uh, they go with, I think, five different families and they do a hundred birds and they do it twice a year. And they've done it for the last four or five years. That's a good, that's a good point. What's a good number for them to, I mean, to get that tra uh, trailer fired up and make it, you know, worth all the effort of cleaning up and everything, what's a good number? You try to shoot for a hundred birds. Uh, it's real nice with uh, four people. Uh, processing birds, each have a different station, and um, 100 birds is a real nice afternoon. It's, it's not too hard, and you can handle that. You know, we do a few more than that uh, when we process, and I'm sure Brad does more when he processes, but if you're not knowing what's going on, you know, 100 birds is really easy. Is it expensive? Have you looked at the rental? The processor right now, I think it's still going to be $100 a day for the rental, and then $125 on the weekends. So it's not that expensive, um, and it's a fantastic unit. It has everything. It has a, the kill cones. It has a scalder. It has a plucking machine. It has eviscerating cables. It has chilled water sinks. Um, so it has absolutely everything you it, need. It's about a forty thousand dollars setup that you're renting for a hundred bucks. It's a good. It's a good value. Uh, takes a little bit of training to figure out how to run it efficiently, but it's a it's a neat tool that's local here. Can those birds be resold? It, if you process them on farm, so you need to look into the regulations. If you process them on farm, you can resell them to direct to a consumer. If you hire somebody to do the processing, uh, not likely. So there, there are specific regulations on that, and, and it's a nightmare. It's, it's a spider web. It, it would take a long time to go through the regulations involved with poultry processing. On processing in general as well, a smaller scale, back to your original question, I think one thing that's important to realize is that if there's there's a big gap between uh, the homesteading range and a commercial range. For example, for me, I have, you know, maybe I raise, how many chickens do I need in a year? If we eat one, one whole chicken a week, I mean, I need 52 chickens. Well. So for me, if I'm just trying to raise for my own family, that's $2 a chicken if I do it myself, if I rent that trailer for a day, right? At $100, 50 chickens. So that's still a pretty good price, you know, add the food into it and my original purchase price, it's still a pretty good value for chickens if I'm gonna run, you know, 50 through there. But obviously if I share that with somebody else, um, you know, you're gonna get closer and closer. Now, do I run, do I grow 50 chickens of my own? Uh, every year? No. Mostly what I do uh, is just butcher my roosters that I hatch, that hatch out from, and those I feed to my dogs. So I do those myself like six or eight at a time usually. And so there's a, there's a balance there. And I know a lot of people don't want to butcher their own chickens, but maybe that's, that's one of the things that I talk to folks about who are interested in doing their own livestock is make sure that the things that you've chosen to do are the things that you want to do. You know, understand the whole process of them. Like goats, for example. If you're gonna have goats, you're gonna be milking every 12 hours, whether you like that or not, whether you're not gonna get the effect. Can your lifestyle support that, you know? Maybe not, maybe so. Did you say you have a plucking machine? You need to see the trailer. It has a, it has a, like Rob talked, it has kill cones, it has a scalder. A, it's a beautiful scalder. Is it out there? It's outside, yeah, and it's got a rotary picker, uh, it's, and it's a, it's a pretty slick machine. The plucking, the plucking machine, the way it works is there's little rubber fingers, and they move the, the, they move the bird through the, along those fingers, and those rubber fingers are pulling off the feathers, and the scalder uh, loosens the, the skin so those feathers kind of have ease. That, that trailer, if you, if you had about a half a dozen people, I think you could probably crank 100 birds an hour out of that trailer. Wow. Yeah. Do you think that's... If you had if you had some handy bolts, I think. Are you allowing that truck to go up to Truckee? Yes. Not in cold weather. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was too below this morning. It, it was catastrophic about three years ago. Everything froze when it went to Truckee for a night. I know. I was there. <laughs> I was wondering if that. If you want to that was the, the that, that's what I did it.
So the, the question is, here's uh, dairy goats, and um, he doesn't want to bring alfalfa in from the outside, can't grow alfalfa where he is, what would the goats like to eat? So my first, uh, what kind of grass would the goats like to eat? My first answer to your question is, goats are browsers. They eat above the grass. That's what they prefer. Shoulder up. Yeah, shoulder up the goats. So um, I would be looking for things that have high protein, that carry that high protein through the year. The best two that I know of in our area, and Brad has something to say about this too, are blackberry, which is invasive around here. It's a great source of food for them in the winter. And uh, ceanothus. We have several different kinds of ceanothus, but those two are the most readily available. You'll recognize ceanothus. It's, um, it's a native plant. It comes where there's a, in a fern usually. They're one of the pioneer plants from ferns. And it's got a lot of spiky, um, short stems on it and really small leaves. Uh, anywhere from four to eight feet tall. What other food is that for goats? Goats, goats eat almost all of our, our foothill vegetation. Uh, if you're in a dairy situation, it's a little bit different. I, the goats that I run, I don't dairy any goats. We have a commercial meat herd and uh, they're, they are foragers. They're, they're browsers and we don't feed them. Uh, my feed bill on my commercial goats is probably about $12 a year. It's probably negative something. Because well, and actually money. we get paid for the goats to go out. So all, all these girls all know how to go out and find, find their own groceries. Um, in a dairy situation, you need to be pumping the calories. To, and so you need to talk to uh, someone who's more experienced in dairy. On the, I, I doubt that you're going to plant a grass that's going to give you as much punch as that alfalfa deer feed. And if, if you're looking to make production, I think the alfalfa is probably a pretty good answer for you. Are you talking about for a homestead situation or are you talking about for a commercial situation? So what I do with mine is I let my uh, milking girls out into the brows during the day. And then I bring them back and I segregate them from the rest of the group and I let them eat out. The only the ones that I'm milking, I feed them alfalfa in the evening. Do you still push them out during the winter or do you kind of keep them warm? In my area, winter, I mean, I'm warmer than it's here. I'm over and already. So yeah, all year, all year round. And that's where those two plants that I mentioned, the ceanothus and the uh, blackberry, I look for areas, I save those areas in the spring and summer when I'm putting them out on browse, I save those areas until the winter because that's the only place that I have that real good protein source. What would you recommend for a good uh, meat goat? What would you recommend for a good meat goat is the question. That's your department. Yeah. So our goats are a, uh, our goats are a mix. I call them foothill foragers. Uh, they are uh, <laughs> they're they're a, a conglomerate, and I select for mother ability. So if you're uh, if you're familiar with like the beef master breed of cattle, that was all selected based on mother ability and ability to thrive on native vegetation. So my girls, uh, their their foundation stock is Spanish brush goats, which means there's a herd of goats that came out of Oklahoma, and Spanish brush goats is generic for turned loose by the conquistadors 300 years ago. And, that, and so uh, they're Spanish brush goats, which is kind of a breed, and then we have pretty strong Boer and Kiko influence into there. Um, and I select strictly on mother ability and ability to, I go out in my goats right now, and everybody's looking fat and happy, and there's somebody that looks run down. There's no reason she should be run down when everybody else She's been on the same feet as everybody else. If she's run down, she's gone. Because she can't cut it on the same program. I don't care what the reason is. I don't care if she's got a bad day or whatever. If she's run down and everybody else looks good, she's gone. And so that's, and if she can't produce two kids, if she can't mother up and have a decent kid crop every year and can't raise those animals to weaning, she's gone. And so we have a pretty Darwinian process. But I'm, I'm pretty strict on it, and I've got a pretty good herd of girls doing that. So, And they go out and they make money for me. A lot of folks like Brad put, put together a program where they are scoring these, uh, whatever the livestock is, they score them as they go. So 
uh, when they deliver, um, how many did she have? Uh, two or more, that's, uh, you get, a, you know, one point. Uh, two, then, or uh, more than two, you get a point. Just two, you get no points. Uh, if you have less than two, then you get negative one point. So they have a really sy simple, you know, three-star system, if you will. And so then they say, okay, how many did she have? Did she have them? Does she need any assistance? Did they all live when she had them? Um, you know, does she fall, did they follow her around and does she keep track of them? Or, or do I see her kids, you know, roaming off by themselves and not being attended to? So all along they're trying to rank different aspects of that animal's uh, mothering nature and then selecting from that. And the reason that he didn't have a specific breed for you is that a lot of the commercially developed, like the Borers or the Kikos or um, even the Spanish heat goats that you find that are from breeder stock, a lot of those have been bred to be in a paddock, you know, on a, in a more feedlot situation. So folks like he and I, we're trying to select for these traits that are going to be able to go out there and take care of their own business. I have a goat that I absolutely despise right now. I, I despise her half the time and I have great respect for her the other half of the time because she has the ability, she'll go out and tell the other goats, don't eat that, eat this. Don't do that, do this. And sometimes the thing that she tells them to do is follow her over the electric fence when she knocks it down. But the other things that she tells them to do is, you know, eat the right things at the right time of year. So I, I want her, I want her bloodline, but I don't want her, you know, to teach them other, you know, I want that. So it's, that, it's, a, it's a difficult balance, but a lot of the times I think you look at guys that are trying to do stuff like this out in a more natural setting or off of the feedlot setting, and you're gonna find people that are doing crossbreeds of, of goats. I run a crossbreed as well, so it's trying to be understood as its own breed, but it's tender, and it's a multi-purpose uh, dairy and meat breed. And it's a three-quarter size goat, so they're easy, easier for me to handle, and they have a really good feed to dairy and feed to meat ratio. And I've chosen them because they're a hardier, smaller goat, and I don't have a big area of food for them to eat. You slaughter your own. Oh, we haven't slaughtered any yet. He's gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna partner up. We'll put that video online for you. <laughs> Hold on. Wait. We'll let on the right first, and then on the left next, <laughs> or other way around. Yeah. Same thing for sheep and goats. She has uh, sheep and goats, and she's having trouble with the sheep, uh, or having trouble with the goats. The sheep are staying, and that is all it's going to be the case. They like the netting. Yeah. So. You need new goats. Yeah. I, that, that's not a joke. That's you need new goats. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. And start with some goats that are expensive. Ne never take a free goat. Every free goat on Craigslist. <laughs> Is a jumper. Is, is somebody woke up and is standing on the hood of their truck, <laughs> and that's why it's on. And so, so you need new goats. It, you're not gonna you're not gonna correct a goat that has learned to get out of the fence. I have that problem, and that's exactly the situation I'm in. What I what I do now is that I have a uh, about a 52 inch. Uh, three rail fence that has no climb fence on the inside of it and I have electric on the bottom and the top of that. And they will stay inside of that fence. But then any of the electrical netting, even I have 48 inch electrical netting and I have 42 inch electrical netting, and they jump over it wherever it sags, if they find a rock that's, you know, me to that, uh, that table away from the fence, and they'll run and they'll hit that rock and then they'll, you know, not make it over the fence but tear it down and then everybody including the guard dog is out behind them. The joke is, sheep see a fence and say, eh, eh, oh well. And goats see a fence and say, I will go without food for the rest of the day, but I'm gonna figure out how to get over that fence. The question is, how can you tell when a browsing goat is getting enough food uh, doesn't need supplements? Her body condition will tell you. If she's slick coated, it, as long as you got minerals in front of her, if she's slick coated and she looks. It, it, it's hard to explain. You can tell by looking. 
but her body condition, if you can see a lot of bones where there wasn't bones before, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, the, the browsing with goats, and it's the same with cows or sheep or anything, they learn it from mama. So when you go to buy a goat, and I don't know how this turned into like a goat workshop, but that's, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, when, when you buy any animal, if they're raised with their head in a feed bunk, that's where they go to find feed, and they don't know how to go out. If you go to buy a goat and they're out in the woods and they're out following mama and they're breaking down trees and getting feed, that's the goats, that's the ones you want. And that's why I, my, my girls, I, I told you, I call them foothill foragers. Um, that it's taken us a lot of years to put together a good herd of animals that can go out and find feed. And they're not looking at me and they're not crying at me. When they see me coming with a dog and a bike or whatever, uh, they don't think, they never think that I'm bringing feed. They see me setting up fence, they know I'm putting them onto new feed. But they never think that that guy is going to throw them a flake of hay. That, that's never crossed their mind. Uh, they're able to go out there and find feed on them. Okay. Yeah, we'll touch on more in just a second. Um, so back to the, the question about how can you tell. So the two things that you should keep in mind though is that there's, there's dairy goats and then there's meat goats. And so dairy goats will always have, right in front of that hip, they'll always have a sunken side. So don't think that that's an indication that they're, you know, that they're malnourished. And then he made the point quickly, but the slick coat versus the rough coat is the best indication for me. When I go out and I'm looking at my herd or if I'm you know, curious about how people are doing, I, I look a lot, it's one of the easiest things to see and the best way to describe it is if you, if you look at the way his beard looks compared to the way you know, normal like head hair looks, not that he's malnourished, but like the roughness of that, like the slit ends on the, the hair, and seriously, the roughness of it is what I look, when you agree, that's what, I mean, that's the best thing compared to. But then if you see a sick, yeah, if you see a slick, uh, soft coat on the animal, that's, those are some of the best indications. So all three of you guys are the first. We are. That's true. So you were asking, um, worming, goats, you're using diatomaceous surf and? Basic H. Basic H. I, for one, I don't worm my goats. I have beagles done on my goats, I have beagles done on my horses every time I have the vet out. And I always look for a small uh, population of usually, do you remember the, what's the ones that come out of the soil that are natural? Anyway, I look for a small population of the natural indigenous uh, gut microbes and parasites. That's, some of that is supposed to be there. Um, we've had zero counts on our horses, uh, beetles for six years we've been doing this. And I think for the last three, we've only, um, we haven't worms at all, and before that, we were worming every six months or every year. So we've really started tapering that out. And I, don't, I don't address worming at all with any, with diatomaceous earth or any other solution, personally. Is that My animals spend about a third of their time in a paddock, and about a third of the time in a, in a like a two acre pasture area, and about a third of their time out on um, open brush, so I wouldn't contribute it to that. I run goats, horses, chickens, and my livestock guardian dog all in the same area, and I think the chickens are a dead end for par are a dead end for parasites. So I think the chickens contribute to that, but I don't know if it's a diet specific thing. Travis, you worm? You don't worm? You can also worm with uh, chewing tobacco. That's an old wives' tale about that. So you can worm with that and garlic. In the purple? Um, I went on the internet and there was a recipe for molasses and garlic powder. I don't know if it helped with the worm, but the meat is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> the molasses is all it's doing is making the garlic more palatable. Oh. If you can put the garlic in a, a bowl of capsule and put it down, they'll yeah. take it that way about three but capsules per 100 pound weight. It's usually what you do. But the only way you can really tell is to have a people. Right. There's a, fo a FOMACHA test. You can tell by the... Uh, well, looking uh, at the pig, 
Yeah, and look at the yeah, and then on their on their gums, you can tell. And if they're white, if they're white, they got a worm load. Just foul breath. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. But that hair, that hair coat will also tell you if they're if they're poor too. If they're got a, a bad hair coat to them, right. it'll right. it'll tell you a lot. And, and their activity level and just their their watery eyes, different things, you know, all kinds of different things. Just know your animals, look at them. You said look healthy to you. That's a big what thing. does a people count run? What's the best price? Price wise? I think it's like fifteen or twenty five dollars, depending on the vet. And how often do you do it? I I do it whenever whenever I have it's it's hard to get a fecal specifically from a, you know each animal in your herd and it's pretty it's pretty difficult to you need to have this attached to there? Okay. Yeah, somebody took it off the other one. Sorry. Um, you need to have it, you need to have, um, it's hard to get a sample for each animal in your herd. So what I usually do is whenever I get new animals on my property, um, I'll have them tested for a myriad of things to make sure I'm not introducing those things into my herd. But and at that point, I'll try to get a fecal from that group. I usually keep them in a stall until I get all my test results back. So um, I'll do that, and then I'll also, when I have the vet out for other things, if I haven't had any new ones in a while, I'll just take samples that are, you know, from around and assume that if I go with, I assume that they're all good if a few samples test okay. Multi-species grazing, can you run a dairy cow with uh, other species? Yeah, in general. Um, I've, had, I've had a lot of success with running um, all of my animals together. And one of the things that I like is that my chickens kick through the horse manure, and that makes it into this nice duffy loam and keeps the, pests, or the uh, parasites out of it. And uh, they kind of all work together, and they build relationships with one another, and it helps with predators and all of those kinds of things. It's nice. Yes, sir. So there's actually laws on that. <clears throat> That's great. Pigs on the pigs on. So he's asking. He wants to run hogs through vegetable fields, and so I've got a little. This is a side business I didn't mention, and I use pigs for rototilling gardens or or fields, or actually for land renovation. Uh, <clears throat> it's just a byproduct of having critters and knowing how to move them around. Uh, so you're looking, if the food touches the soil, you're looking for a 120-day withdrawal. If it doesn't touch it, it's a 90-day. Uh, pigs do a great job. You, you need to follow them up with chickens just because they're going to hammer some of the ground and then some of it not. But it, it's so much fun. And they're, they're also going to glean the field. And if you have residual, if you have residual crop waste in the field, they're going to clean all that up so that way you're not carrying over your pests that you would ordinarily, say you're growing lettuce in the same place three years in a row, you start to, you, you have that crop waste on the field and you're having some residual pests that are hiding out in there, the pigs are gonna clean all that junk out of there and you're not gonna have those issues. Uh, but you do need to be concerned about it. I don't know if you actually need to be concerned, but there is a legal issue with the 120 days. CCOF will shut down your field if they find out that you've run animals in there. So be aware of that, if, depending on how you're marketing your produce. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, were you done? I, I, I think so. If they get, yeah, so she's got a Jersey calf, uh, Jersey, a little bull calf and a little heifer calf, I guess. Okay, two little Jersey heifers, and they're getting really fat. It's, yeah, it's like if it's winter time, I don't think that's a huge deal. If they're too fat, they won't breed up. That's the only thing. Okay, it, if they're too fat, they won't breed up. So that's the only thing I'd be concerned about. <laughs> Diet and exercise. <laughs>
Rob's in meat. Ed, he, he knows more about it than anybody here. And our chickens keep liver. Boy. two questions. Uh, as far as meat chickens, it depends on what you really want. There's a lot of different heritage breeds. We use a, a commercial breed, which is not a Cornish cross, because we have them out in pasture and we don't want them to break down. Um, yeah, yeah, and once you find that if you get a, a Cornish bred bird or something like that, they will basically starve to death or die from lack of water if the water and feeds, you know, 50 feet apart. They won't go, they won't travel. Um, so that's why we use the, a Ross 500. Um, it's a white bird. It's a little bit more aggressive as far as pasture. Aggressive? It'll travel. Oh, okay. it, it really, it moves. It goes out. In the, yeah. Um, it's like the, the land birds we use, we, we have a brown bouvon, which is a real small little uh, land hen, but they'll travel five acres to, to forage. And do you separate your land hens from your meat? Yes, we do. Yeah. The meat was a Ross 500. Yeah. A brown bouvon. And we've just decided on the brown bouvon over years um, because everybody has their own preference because if you have a a commercial flock where you're raising eggs, I don't really care what they look like. Ours are all brown. Um, but if you want colorful flocks or something like that, you'll get a different, you know, maybe a Delaware, maybe you'll get Araconas, uh, whatever you prefer in your own uh, personal flock. So that's what it all boils. And are they sick now, or they just stopped laying, or what's, I mean, because a lot of them won't have disease, it's just the cold weather right now that birds don't lay, and then you can supplement their light uh, to keep them going. There's also different... Bones sticking out, they keep, you know, we eat food, but they look a little lethargic, not moving as well, and they're not getting weight. They may be wormy, you can put the diatonaceous earth in them and different things. What's that? Yeah. Do you, um, where'd you get the chickens? Like someone hatched them out or they came from a commercial? From the farm store down there? So they were probably, um, they're, they probably, they probably had vaccinations. I've had problems with um, ones that we've raised on site that, don't, that we don't vaccinate, having some problems with that. But these, you guys do non-vaccinated birds, right? They do no vaccines, no uh, antibiotics, any of that stuff? Yeah. 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 They're a little bit. They're a little bit more hardy. Um, just in general, guinea hens are than than chickens. Um, I think it's. Without, there's a lot of environmental things that could go into that. There's a lot of like individual characteristics about that. Um, for us, uh, for us on our place, it's we used to like keep track of how many chickens we have and uh, what their names are and all that stuff. And now we've gotten to the point where it's like somebody says, "How many chickens do you have?" And I'm like, uh, "Twenty some odd." I don't even. I couldn't even tell you right now. Um, it's a difference between if, if those chickens are pets or if those chickens are a business. No, if the, pets, and so if it's a business, deal with it like it's a business. It could be just the same as people in this room. There's somebody in here that's sick and a chicken can get sick. If they're all getting it, I'd look at an environmental thing. Yeah. It could be a stress, it could be as simple as stress. You got bears wandering in the neighborhood and they're all freaked out. It could, it could be something as simple as that. Tem temperature change. Now that we're on poultry, um, we're going back to goats. I've been <laughs> raising my broilers with some turkeys together the last couple of years, and it seems like they're doing okay. I've bred otherwise. What's your opinion on that? Do you do we raise turkeys and broilers. And uh, <clears throat> if you start the turkeys with the broilers, which is probably what you're doing, you're, we have not had problems. So that's pretty anecdotal. Uh, 
That's my understanding from uh, talking to a lot of people. If you, if you start the turkey, if you start the poults with chickens, you will not have issues. If you introduce them later, the uh, blackhead is a pretty serious, and that will be 100% fatal. The turkeys have to be started with the chicks. The other thing about turkeys, so if anybody wants to raise turkeys, they're incredibly stupid. And I keep them with the chicks because the, like, the chicks show the turkeys how to eat. Because if you take, if you take baby chicks, my wife, when they, go, when they come to mail, she shows everyone food and water before she puts it in. I just dump them in the brooder, but she shows every single bird food and water, food and water. You do that with the turkeys, and they, three minutes later, they don't have any idea where food or water is. You have to have them with those little chicks to show them so they can see the chick, go to the water, go to the food. And, uh, but having them together, it seems like they do a lot better health-wise anyways. Who is... You guys have to figure out who is next because I really, I'm going to offend somebody. Bob. What kind of pigs do you have? We raise uh, Berkshires. But we're, we're small. We're a mom and pop. We have two sows, and uh, we breed them a couple, three times a year, I guess. And uh, So the Berkshires are fun black pigs. Do you suck them out? Yes. Yes. I buy, uh, I buy corn from some Mennonites down in Glen and feed that and myriad of things. Uh, I've raised, yeah, like all the blue butts and Yorks and Hamps and I, we just like the Burks because they're cool. Burks also have a higher fat content in their meat. They take a little bit longer to raise, but they are a preferred by chefs and people that, people that actually cook and, and really want a better quality of meat. The Berkshires, they're a black Berkshire, they, but they'll take, they'll take a, a month longer to, to finish out, whereas a, a commercial uh, three-way cross pig with, has more hybrid vigor to it, um, the commercial farmer's doing it, and so what their rate is to get pounds of meat on the table. Uh, the quality is usually not what the commercial guy is looking for. He's looking for quantity speed. and speed to get it there. It's like the same thing with the poultry, where it takes us eight weeks to raise a bird, a commercial hatchery will take that same bird and be done in four weeks. So big difference. What in, farm? Yeah, back to basic farms, uh, and it's a, the local markets. This lady over here in the back. Well, the, the, what they're talking about is raising them together because the turkeys will do better when they're with chickens because they'll learn to eat and, uh, <laughs> and find water on their own. And so, but once they're adults, they, I mean, how long does that usually take you guys before they get it? You think you can separate them from chickens? You know, you could really, be, the turkeys need a little bit higher protein than the broilers do, so the turkeys are looking at like a 22% in a, in a grower ration. But you can feed them, you can feed them the regular broiler ration that, for the meat birds, uh, and we could just give them like extra hard-boiled eggs for the, to supplement the protein. But so once the chickens are, once you've harvested the chickens at eight weeks or whatever, yeah, the turkeys will just keep on growing; they'll be fine. No. No, I, I, no, chickens and turkeys are food for everything. And so, yeah, so you need a way to, you need to either run them in at night or have a way to protect them. So they need to have electric fence to keep predators away. You need to have a guard dog. Or, or you're going to just feed a ton of wildlife. In the pink back there. Because you're rotating uh, chickens, are they, are they fine, are they kind? 
We've had a pile of guard dogs. I can't count how many guard dogs. I, I think I stopped naming them years ago. Uh, and, and our guard dogs, by accident, we had a litter of, well, we had a litter of pups on our home place, and most of our guard dogs are out with the commercial herd. But uh, we, we had a litter at home, and one of the pups that we had had a hard time getting rid of, one day, it's like she just woke up and realized that she was actually going to protect the chickens. And it was a, holy cats, this has never happened before. All of our other guard dogs, without fail, would kill everything that wasn't a sheep or a goat. Would, and it wasn't a mean thing. It wasn't a recreational thing. It was a, my job is to kill things that aren't sheep or goats. And so all of a sudden, this dog realized that she was a guardian of chickens because the chickens were on the place. And it worked out perfectly. Uh, and so... It, people will tell you that it's a breed to breed, and I don't think it is. I think it's I think it's an individual animal, and you can have a litter of six pups, and four of them you're better off to knock them in the head than even put them out with anything. Uh, Does he remember it now? Yeah. Is your, is your question specifically about chickens or livestock guardians for... I was wondering, though, if anybody had trouble integrating a two-year-old dog into livestock. But it sounds like it's just again. So I have, I have a situation that's almost exactly like what you're asking. So I got a livestock guardian dog that um, had been doing livestock work uh, with goats uh, before I got him. I got him when he was two years old. And he had never been in a shared pen with anything other than boar or meat goats. 200 goats, 200 acres is what he ran when I got them. They closed down their business. They were getting older. They couldn't run goats anymore. I bought the guard dog from them, put him in my shared community pen with my chickens and everything, and he wouldn't eat the chickens. He would chase them and play too rough with them. And so, um, but he would never actually consume the chicken. You know, he would play with it, and then he'd be like, oh, well, that's not, that's not as fun as it was when I was chasing it around. So I was like, well, this is a problem because I need to be able to run him and the goats and the chickens all together. And lots of folks told me it's never going to happen. And a few folks told me, tie the dead chicken to his neck until it falls apart on the bone. And a few folks, a few folks told me, have very serious discussions with him about how he's not supposed to do this. So I didn't think my neighbors would like it if I tied a chicken to my dog's neck and let him run around the... So I did that. I went out and I had very serious conversations with him and to the point where I had my hand around his throat and I had him pinned to the ground and I was hitting him with the chicken that he just killed and, you know, if my neighbors would have saw, they probably would have called, you know, animal control on me, but I had to, I had to get him to the point where he was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my life if I do this again. And it's it's pretty close to the reality of the situation for me. If he's not going to guard my animals, he has no purpose on my farm. And I think I lost, I think I lost three um, in the first two or three weeks that he was there. And then I started this regiment of every day I would go out. If I saw him doing it, I would go out there and we would have a serious discussion. And about, I think I lost three more after that, and then he stopped. And now he's in and out with them. He'll be away from chickens for two months at a time, I'll put them back in with the chickens, nobody gets hurt. So it's all, I, th I believe that it's a training thing. I have a, a guard dog that's very socialized to humans and to pet dogs, and I always worry about him not doing what he needs to do when like a rogue dog from outside the neighborhood comes in or something like that. But he's always, we've, we haven't lost a chicken, well, except for the ones that he ate <laughs> or he played with. We haven't lost a chicken, a goat, or um, anything else to predators in the two years that we've had him. And all my neighbors have seen mountain lions and bobcats and everything else on their property. And we had a goat taken down uh, just a few doors down by a mountain lion recently. So, yes. My livestock guardian dog is an um, Anatolian shepherd crossed with the Great Pyrenees. With the Great Pyrenees. What are yours? Yours are mostly... Uh, Great, great Pyrenees mixes. Cows. Cows. Steers. Steers. Uh, can you raise one by itself when you have other livestock? 
Can you raise one by itself? I'd try it. I think, yeah, I, they're a herd animal. So as long as they figure out that the horse is kind of its buddy, you know, they eat similar things. Horses, it seems like if you stick a steer in, especially just a lone steer in with a horse, the horse is going to want it because it's likely that that horse in its life has been used to work cattle. The horse might get in there and work it and run a little bit of the flesh off. Uh, I, it's, you see it all the time. But, uh, yeah, it, I'd throw a steer in with, with some goats or something. They'll, they, they figure it out. They, they'll figure out their pecking order. As long as it's not by itself. I wouldn't try to raise it in a pen all by itself. It'd go berserk. Anybody else out there? Questions? Uh, in the back? What any of our chicken coops are like. Yep. So the, the coop that I run is um, it's built into a corner of my barn and it's elevated. And I have a chicken wire floor. And underneath the chicken wire floor, I have a wood that has uh, linoleum on it so I can fold these wood trap doors down and scoop all the manure into five gallon buckets. Um, it's about, it's probably about uh, 40 or so square feet. Um, and I run 20 to 40 chickens in it. I don't close the door at night, they put themselves away. I run a light on a timer and um, I adjust that timer so that it kicks on just before dusk, and then I leave it on longer in the winter to give them more artificial light to keep them laying, and then I tone it back in the summer so that it just comes on for like the half hour, 45 minutes at dusk, and that, that draws them in because when it starts getting dark, if there's a light source somewhere that they're used to going, they're drawn towards that, so they put themselves away at night. Chicken coops. Our meat birds, we raise in Salatin style tractors, just the uh, movable pens, the 10 by 12 ish that scooch along the pasture. Our laying, our laying hens, which I suspect is what you're asking about, uh, most of our laying hens, uh, we got a handful of rogues that kind of just patrol the yard and whatnot. But uh, the chief flock of layers is in a little. Uh, I tore down an old camp trailer that I got for free on Swap Shop or something. And it, so it was a 20 foot by 8 foot camp trailer and I put in a slatted floor and a shed roof on it. It's pretty simple. And I just tow it around with the tractor and put an electric fence around it and it works out. And I think we got uh, maybe 40 layer boxes on the sides and then it's got roosts inside of it and it's home to about 150 to, it would probably max out at 200 hens. But it's, huh? Rob's is serious. How many chickens you run, Rob? He doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, 12,000. We've got, yeah, a lot of chickens. Uh, probably over maybe 1,500, 1,200, something like that. But um, the majority of people, and the questions I get is, what can I do to make a quick, simple house? Uh, a Quonset hut, uh, take some PVC with some tarps over it. Real simple. Uh, you can move it. We've put, had them before, or sort of like Brad with his chicken tractors. Uh, you put some hoop houses on PVC and make them into skids and slide them around in your pasture. Uh, works out great for hens. Uh, put some nesting boxes in them and, and do them that way. It's sort of whatever works for you, how many you have, how much room you need. Uh, chickens, uh, a lot of the chickens just because we're, we're completely free range, uh, rest, nest in the, in the trees up on the barns or in the doghouse, dog you know. Um, we have a place for them to lay eggs and majority of them will go to that, those places every day, but it is, you know, we have certain places that we know where they, they lay every day also, so it's an Easter egg hunt around there. But for the most part, yeah, it's, uh, the birds will go to their place at night if you have a light on them. It'll also help production. Um, so all those little things do help with the, the eggs. And the heat of the feed, the protein in your feed in the wintertime, you might want to up that a little bit so your hens will stay warmer and they'll produce a little bit more. You can put um, kale or whatever you want in there just to up it, maybe put, it, put them on a broiler ration uh, in the, in the wintertime so it keeps them a little hotter. Back there at the back part. How 
How many birds fit in a 10 by 12 broiler coop? When they're small, when they just go out on pasture, you could put 100 birds on there. But we, to raise them out, 75 is pretty comfortable. If you get, if you get tighter than that, you, you, if you get to 100 birds and you raise them all the way out to, to harvest with 100 birds in a 10 by 12, you have to move it twice a day because they, they'll start putting down a lot of manure. So 75 works for us. No, it, oh, that was a different. So chickens are monogastric, and so they're not able to convert. So they get some benefit out of the grass. The, they get a lot of benefit out of the insects and stuff. If you had enough insects on it, this is actually, I stole this from Chris Kirsten at Chafin. It's pretty smart. He says, if you have enough bugs on your property to feed chickens entirely, you have another issue that needs to be dealt with. <laughs> So chickens, they will not get enough of their full nutrition off of pasture. You have to feed them grain. And so we feed them. The meat birds get a broiler ration. If we just had a dozen chickens just kicking around the farmyard, I don't think I'd have to feed them. But to make production, to make a commercial production, we do have to feed. Does that answer kind of is? Go ahead. OK. The first problem in that equation is that one cow by itself is gonna, what did you, what was the word? Go berserk? Yeah. It's gonna go berserk. So if we up, let's just, so we can play inside the same logic space, let's say it's two cows on uh, two acres rotationally, and is that a two acre plot for each rotation, or is that two acres that we're moving him around on? So you have an acre of land, can you run a couple of cows on there and follow them by chickens and make that work? Sheep would be better. The answer is it depends on your land. It's, and that's a cop out. Obviously, that's, a, that's a me dodging the question. Yes, it's possible. And I don't know if it's possible on your place. I, I think that's a stretch. It'd be fun to try. So, so if anybody went to Chris's talk, it's, it was great. It's on YouTube. <clears throat> So he has it broken down. If you had one roll of electric fence netting, makes a 40 foot by 40 foot square. If you move that every day, it would take you 27 days to cover one acre of ground. So where, it would take you 27 days to get back to where you started from. So instead of a cow on an acre, I would start with two sheep maybe. And that would be a lot more doable. You have a lot less live weight per and chase them around and G Kirsten K E R S T O N I do know to that end though I do know there's a actually Dennis who uh, is the mastermind behind this whole conference he put um, he's got a five acre parcel and I would say about two and a half of it is that front pasture that he runs those cows in and he's got what's he got four right now but, well, that's what I was going to say, though. He's got four on it right now, and he rotationally grazes them, but he feeds a lot of hay as well. So if you want to supplement with the hay, but the idea here, though, the thing that I, I'm, because the end of your question was without messing up the property. So he's got four on two acres that he feeds hay to, and they're going, and he rotates them around to keep the pressure off of the one particular area. And his, play, his pasture looks beautiful. So don't, the, the without ruining it is just a matter of how much food is supplied there and you could offset that by, by supplementally feeding. And the other, the other cop out in that question is that there are cows and there are cows. So choose wisely when you choose, you know, if you get the two sheep thing to work and you wanna move up to two cows, get small cows. You know, there's, there's smaller breeds of meat cows that you can get your hands on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Was this helpful? Was this useful for you guys? Great. Go ahead. Is there a no-fly type duck? Rob's a duck expert. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, it depends. We also raise ducks for duck eggs. Uh, we use a white Peking duck because it's a dual purpose breed. Uh, it's a great meat duck as far as it produces a pretty uh, good egg production per year. A khaki Campbell would be a better if you just wanted egg production all the time. And they don't really need water. Uh, so you can do them on a dry lot situation or in pasture. They do real well in pasture. Well, a khaki Campbell or, or a white Peking, uh, there's a lot of different ducks that don't need to have a water base. They enjoy it, but they don't need to have it. So we're uh, already over time, but there's no one here behind us. So if anybody else has any, any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Yeah, if you want to see the poultry processing trailer, that's a really cool thing. You can go out this door, or you can go out this way. Actually, you should go out that way and go down there. If you guys could do us the great favor of filling out one of those surveys and turning it in in the entryway, if you haven't done that already, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I think we're all set. We're going to talk about soil bacteria and gut bacteria today, and we're going to try to draw some parallels between them. And as some of you know, my name is Dale Jacobson, I'm a chiropractor in Nevada City, and I was raised in Nevada City, and I was raised on a property right next door to the old county farm. Some of you might know where that was, if you know where the old county hospital was out Willow Valley Road. And a big hospital out there where the HEW building became. And the county farm raised vegetables and meats for the county hospital and to a certain extent for the county jail, which of course you couldn't do anymore, but that's where the food came from for the, for the county farm. And so, you can hear me okay? And I was raised with organic gardens. You need, do you need the microphone? Okay. Possibly. Or use the tall chair. No, because I have to look down on the computer. So this will work, maybe. So I was raised with raw cow milk and raw goat milk. My parents went out and found it. There was various places in those days you could buy it back in the 50s for 50 cents a gallon. And we thought that was outrageous. Still having a hard time hearing? Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me in the back? Yeah. If you like, we can start again and then uh, just edit that front part out. Okay. Or can I talk through the microphone or? Can't. I thought I had a loud voice. Okay. So very quickly again, my name is Dale Jacobson. I was raised in Nevada City. I've been a chiropractor now for about 35 years here. And I was raised in Nevada City. And I was raised out by the old county hospital, if you know where that is, out Willow Valley Road. Now the HEW building. And we were raised next to the old county farm. The county farm was where the county raised all kinds of meats and vegetables and fruits for the county jail. So that's where most of the food came from. Now it would be considered probably illegal because the food wouldn't be inspected and they wouldn't have licensed food handlers, but in those days, not a problem. I was raised with organic gardens. We went out and got composting materials quite frequently. Um, my mother composted. A couple years we came in second place in the Nevada County Fair sweepstakes for vegetables, so she had a going concern. And when I was about 19, I ran into a gentleman named Bernard Jensen. You probably heard of him. He was an old chiropractor down in Southern California. He was one of the iridology doctors, and he had a huge health ranch down there. And I was very impressed with that. And he talked about soil microbes and goat milk, goat yogurts. And I started to realize my parents, even though they were totally crazy, they weren't stupid. This was good food. <laughs> so all the gardening we were doing and the food we were eating was actually excellent, much better for us than I thought. And after I got done with chiropractic college, I came back here. 
And ever since I started my practice, I've been trying to get my patients interested in fermented foods, particularly goat yogurts, number one. If there was more sheep and yak around, that would be good. But right now, we have to deal with goat and cow, still excellent. And so I've tried to get people interested in organic foods and particularly ferments, again, for the bowel bacteria that we'll get into. And a few years ago, I ran into a book by Eve Balfour, if you've heard of her. It's called The Living Soil. She was actually knighted in England for her soil work. And a lot of the work that came to the U.S. from Rodale and what have you, McCarrison came from a lot of the Eve Balfour work in England. And that was about mycorrhiza, which we'll talk about in the second part of the lecture, which is what happens with the soil bacteria and the root hairs. So then, let's see. I discovered about microvilli, which we'll talk about, which is very important, from Natasha McBride, if you've heard of her. She's a Russian doctor who is the head of the Oxford uh, Nutrition Center, and she talks about the microvilli and the fine idiosyncrasies of the gut bacteria. So we're going to start first with the human element. So here we have a rough picture of the digestive system. And what's the function of digestion? It's basically to make big particles into little teeny tiny particles. So your idea is you're going to start eating cannonballs and you're going to end up with tiny BBs and if possible you're going to break those BBs down into single cells which will then be digested. So the concept is here just as in composting you're breaking food down into smaller and smaller particles. So as you know you put food into your mouth and you'll have your salivary glands, you have your parotid glands, you have a tremendous amount of enzymes which are starting to break the food down. Amylases are starting to break food down already your lipases, and as you're chewing your food, for example, if you have a fat in your mouth, your liver is already knowing about it and it's already starting to create bile. So once it's in your mouth, the whole carcass knows about it. <laughs> All right? Food then proceeds to your stomach, through your esophagus, where it is introduced to hydrochloric acid, different enzymes that break proteins down, etc., etc. It's made smaller yet. It then moves into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, where it's broken down more by pancreatic enzymes and bile from the liver. So the particles are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. They move from there through the small intestine into the large intestine, where the fluid is basically taken out so it's dehydrated. So when you poop, you don't have a big problem. Okay. So the idea is that you're making big particles into small particles. Now, through the insiding of your digestive tract, from your mouth to your butt, you have an inner mucus layer. And you find out if you put your finger in your mouth, you're going to find the mucus layer. Huh? So that is basically where your bowel bacteria live. All your bacteria from your mouth to your butt is going to be in that layer. And you can think of it as a big ocean with fish swimming and octopuses and whales. That's your living area. Right? On the very inside of that mucus lining, at the base of it, it's like the base of the ocean, you're going to have what are called villi. And villi are the little teeny fingers that come up that make your small intestine look like a shag rug. So look at your small intestine as being a shag rug with all these little fingers. And there's just millions and millions and millions and millions of these little villi. Now, each villi is interesting because you'll notice the picture on the right that it has a one cell thick coating to it. And those are called epithelial cells. That's just a general name. In this case, they're called enterocytes. So this is something you have to remember, enterocytes. Entero meaning to enter, site, cell. So that's where food is going to leave your gut, come through these cells, then go on to the liver. The liver is the first organ that's going to be hit by the food that's digested. Now inside each villi, to see scope of smallness here, you have a capillary, you have a nerve, and you have a fat vessel. 
So fat is absorbed through the villi, goes back into the lymph system up through the subclavian. And the capillary blood goes into the big vein that goes to the liver. So that's where things happen. Now this little coating of enterocytes gets very interesting because on the top of each villi, you have 30,000 microvilli. So on top of the shag rug, you have billions and billions of little more hairs, which are the microvilli. And these are very interesting because they are the guys that secrete the digestive enzymes. So they are controlling your immunity, they're controlling what's entered into the gut, and you have to have incredibly healthy microvilli if you're going to get anywhere. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Every four villi, you'll find a goblet cell, which are the mucus secreting cells, which helps create the lubrication again. So you can imagine as we go, what happens if you lose this lining, if you lose this mucus level. Here's a microscopic picture of microvilli. Very, very tiny. Remember, 30,000 per villi. And these are where the rubber hits the road in your digestion, which people, we aren't used to talking about this kind of thing yet. But when we're talking about any kind of food, how it's digestive, it's vegan, it's kosher, it's whatever, this is where the action happens in the microvilli. So all your complex nutrients are broken down, particularly proteins, into very simple molecules. Now, if you don't have good microvilli, you don't get the end product of digestion. So let's say you have a, sac <coughs> a saccharide, which is a disaccharide, which is a two-molecule situation. That needs to be broken down into a monosaccharide. It needs to be broken down into a one cell before it's digested properly through that gut wall. If it's digested improperly or not digested at all, it stays in the gut, guess what? The wrong bacteria come along, then they create a toxic situation in the bowel. Same with proteins. If you have, let's say, a milk protein, and you don't have the right proteolytic enzyme from your microvilli, which are the enzymes which break down protein, what's going to happen? Your body's going to say, whoa, there's a foreign object in this bowel. There's a burglar in the house. And if you have an autoimmune response, there's a burglar in the house, but you don't know what room it's in. So you can take your shotgun out and shoot everywhere you can in that house. So the body will actually attack itself and sometimes kill itself. You've heard of people being killed by eating peanuts. So if you have allergic response to a food. But the bottom line of that is you don't have the enzymes to break it down. You don't have the structure to break it down. So you notice in this country now, we have tremendous amount of allergies because people now don't have the gut microvilli and the proper enterocyte protection to produce all this, all right? So on the left, you have a healthy enterocyte with microvilli. Remember, this microvilli now is loaded with the right stuff. It has the right enzymes, and it can break things down. The one on the right is one that's been whacked. So this person's had antibiotics, he's had too many steroids, too many birth control pills, what have you. But the microvilli are now hurt, and there's going to be a problem with assimilation and digestion. Okay? Now, what gets particularly exciting is what's next, which is your gut flora. Your gut flora are very overlooked. The medical profession slowly starting to look at them with probiotics and things. But your gut flora, incredibly important. How much weight of bowel bacteria do we have in our body? Three to five pounds, which is about the weight of your liver. So consider your liver has the same weight as your gut microbes from your mouth to your butt. Three to five pounds, you have only one-tenth of the cells in your body are you, are human. The other 90% are microbes. So you are basically a microbe carrier. You're just a train and a bus for the microbe. So get out of this idea that you're a human. You're just a truck that carries <laughs> microbes. All right? So you have 200 trillion microbes to only 75 trillion body cells. Quite interesting. 
Now your immunity is dependent upon the translation of the bowel bacteria and your microvilli. They have a total cohesion. They have, they're totally necessary for each other. If you have wrong bowel bacteria, the microvilli die. You saw, remember the enterocyte there that faded away, shrunk, etc. And once you start killing enterocytes, you got problems. That's the beginning of your leaky gut syndromes. All your irritable bowels, your ulcerative colitis, which can kill you, your sprue, Crohn's diseases, diverticulitis, polyps, everything is a loss of that gut wall. So that is the universal answer to most gut problems. That's where the rubber hits the road, the intersection between the microbes and the microvilli. So what, what is an ulcer in your stomach? Simply you've lost your mucus lining. You now have the ocean taken away from the sand and you now have an exposed gut lining. You have no protection. So now you're going to hemorrhage and you can possibly die from a perforated ulcer from hemorrhage. But your other symptoms, your irritable bowels, etc., that is a attack on the microvilli slash intestinal bacteria and that's the beginning of your gut disease. I have to talk fast because this is normally an all-day lecture and then the next 15 minutes is another five-hour lecture, so <laughs> we're moving along. So here's some things that your bowel bacteria do, which most of you are probably already aware of. They secrete lactic acid, acetic acid, formic acid, hydrogen peroxide, household bleach. They actually create B vitamins. A lot of the B12s, B6s are actually made by your bacteria, your E. coli that are the good ones. Your bile is basically recycled with your bowel bacteria. They do that. Estrogen. Estrogen is totally recycled. A lot of the United States has the highest osteoporosis of any country in the world. Guess what? People that don't have good bowel bacteria excrete 60 times more estrogen in their excretions than people with good bacteria. That's just one of the clues, along with soda pop. Um, people eat nitrites nitrites in certain processed meats, etc. they turn into nitrosamines, which give you bowel cancer. The bowel bacteria stop the nitrite from becoming a nitrosamine. They tie up mercury. So if you're eating mercury and you have good bowel bacteria, you only store about 1% of the mercury in your gut. If not, you store approximately 90%. Measles vaccinations. Vaccinations in general, the people that have the good bowel bacteria don't get the autism. Okay, so a lot of the vaccination responses are not found as much in people with good flora. But if that baby and the mother have poor flora, that kid is much more susceptible to all the psychotic neurological diseases. Um, all kinds of things happen. Um, here the microvilli also and the bowel bacteria have surfactants which dissolve the cell walls of the bad bacteria. They secrete all kinds of Pre, um, pro carcinogen enzymes, which are the enzymes that break down carcinogenic things. Um, they help create tryptophan, one of the B vitamin areas, and tryptophan is what is responsible for making serotonin. What's serotonin? What's Prozac? Serotonin is your feel good drug. It's, and so if you are lower in serotonin and you get depressed, etc. So people with low bowel bacteria also have a tendency toward depression because they can't build the serotonin. And also, if you're a diet soda drinker, you're inhibiting your growth of serotonin, as an aside. Babies who don't gain weight, failure to thrive in infants, guess what? They don't have the right bifidus infantis in their gut, so they can't hold nitrogen to make protein. So you have babies that can't thrive. And a lot of babies now are already shot when they leave the hospital. And the mothers, if they don't know about bowel bacteria, they can have a colicky kid who's a problem for a couple of years minimum. Um, so, your leaky gut is prevented with good bowel bacteria, but slash in healthy microvilli. Not yet. Well, actually, um, well, go ahead. We'll, we'll come to that. Yeah. So, what are some things that hurt your bowel flora? Chemotherapy, obviously. 
Antibiotics, and people are living on antibiotics now. Antibiotics, they don't just kill the particular pathogenic bacteria that you have, they kill everything. So you turn your rainforest into a desert. And if you don't restore the rainforest in your gut after a course of antibiotics, you're going to be in trouble. So when you look at what the bowel bacteria accomplish, you want that happening for your body. You want that immunity. You want the ability to build B vitamins, etc. Stomach antacids, people who have the wrong diet, um, actually you have too little stomach acid as a rule, though it's considered to be too much acid. So they take acid neutralizers. Guess what that doesn't do to the bad bugs? It doesn't kill them. Now they move on to the intestine, and you get bigger problems. Laxatives in general, same thing, birth control pills. Natasha McBride showed how women who do birth control pills and get pregnant immediately after they stop, or their kids are usually in trouble because they haven't built their flora back to have the proper baby. And just as an aside, where do babies get their bacteria? In a vaginal birth, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> So as the baby comes down the birth canal, all orifices of that baby are inoculated with the mother's bacteria. Guess what the main bacteria is in the reproductive tract? Fallopian tubes and vagina. Lactobacillus acidophilus, most important thing in your small intestine. So they're the mimic. When a woman gets a yeast infection, how come? She's lost her lactobacillus acidophilus. She's become too alkaline, etc. So she needs to replace the bacteria. Yeah, I think I think the loss of ability to kill the yeast. I think the yeast don't live well in a. Yeah. Okay. Pesticides in your foods, herbicides. Most of your food you eat now is herbicide and pesticided. Airplane travel is very tough on your bowel bacteria, one of the reasons you get particularly tired when you land. Smog, C-sections, so lots of things. We don't know about GMOs yet. I suspect when that's looked at, there'll be a huge impact on your bowel flora. These are just simple things, but uh, your bowel bacteria changes with certain medicines. You get increases of the wrong bacteria with many medicines, including aspirins. So you get your hemolytic, even with ibuprofen, you create more campylobacter and hemolytic bacteria, which are the bacteria that break down your iron. Okay. So what are things that the bowel bacteria love? What makes societies healthy? Mammal yogurts. In this society, we have wonderful cow yogurt, wonderful goat yogurt, um, kefir, which is like a liquid yogurt, good buttermilk. All this has to be raw for the most part. Um, raw sauerkraut. Once you cook it, you kill the microbes. Kimchi. Kimchi is like a sauerkraut, but it has multiple vegetables, particularly Asian. All your Koreans and Chinese do kimchi and put in everything they have. It's not just vegetables, it can be monkeys and it can be fish. And it sterilizes everything. You can take a food that's toxic. This happened up with uh, Admiral Byrd, I think, going to the North Pole. He had tinned meats with them on the trip and they got contaminated. So they had botulin and a bunch of stuff and the Indians around said, hey, just ferment them. So they fermented the rotten fish and then that was edible again. So that's how the Vietnamese can eat tremendously disgusting things and not get in trouble because they're doing it in a fermented form. The Jew Is it happening mammal yogurt? Soy? No, it can't be soy. Soy has no value. It's is hazardous. Sheep, is sheep as good as goat? Um, they both have different characteristics. I think the sheep has a little bit more fat and then uh, goat milk has more fat than cow, believe it or not. So, but would you, I mean, is sheep better than cow? If you I think it would probably be a little tiny bit easier to digest, but I'm just guessing. Okay. Kvass is fermented beet. Kumis is fermented mare's milk. That's how Genghis Khan conquered most of Asia. He had, his soldiers had two mares, one for sucking the blood out and making kumis, and the other one for riding to fight. So they had food with the fermented mare's milk and the blood of the horse. And probiotics, which are becoming well well known now, and those are just 
bacteria supplements that you take as a supplement. Again, we want to be careful with those because there's a lot of bogus probiotics. Okay, on to soil microbes. You had a question on, did we answer that? Okay. So a vegan diet, is there any, besides the sauerkraut, and, but there's no good yogurts? No, vegan is dependent upon sauerkrauts and kimchi. Yeah, and you, get, and you get by with sauerkraut nicely. Sauerkraut is a wonderful, wonderful probiotic. There's other lacto-ferments, and there's kombucha, and what's the one with the wheat? There's miso. There's miso. These are all ferments that are good. Okay. Well, I'm supposed to stop now, but I'm going to keep talking real fast through the soil microbes. And then we'll do a couple questions, depending who kicks us out at that point. Okay, so here we have a compost pile. What's a compost pile for? Same thing our digestive system is for. We want to put big stuff in the compost pile. We want to break it down into single, single cells if possible or something very, very small that's usable. So all kinds of things get put into your compost piles, all your organic matters, your leaves, your manures, your seaweeds, all your table scraps from your kitchen. Manures in general, everything gets broken down. So first of all, the big bugs come. You have earthworms, you have your slugs, you have birds, you have snakes, and then they all poop, huh? So the next yeah. layer of species eats the poop. That's the food. They poop. The next guys come along eat the poop. So this goes on and on. The poop gets smaller and smaller. And pretty soon, at the end of the day, after all these little tiny things are eating and pooping tiny, tiny amounts, I'll come back to this. It's interesting, but you now, and your, remember your breakdown also creates heat. So you're not only breaking things down, but you're creating up to 170 degrees of heat in your compost pile, which is going to kill most of your seeds and your pathogens. And so you can put your weeds into a compost pile, and guess what? The weed seeds are killed in a good compost pile. So it's a way of kind of sterilizing everything also. So the end product of your composting is humus. And that's that really fine, fine black crumb material that you have. You find it under oak trees, under the deep layers. You find it in a compost pile. Humus is manna to the soil fungus. Soil fungus depend upon this humus to eat. And it's interesting that a worm casting, which is the worm poop, basically is identical almost to humus, which is why if you have a worm casting in the soil, the plant root will always grow toward it. The plant will grow toward the worm castings. That's where the beef is. Here you can see worm poop above this worm. Worm is quite lubricated. It moves through that soil. It leaves its oil on the inside of the tunnel it makes, and that becomes more food for the smaller microbes, as well as aerating the soil and turning it into a nice sponge. So that humus holds eight times to ten times the amount of water that regular soil holds, stopping the erosion which the Midwest farmers need to learn about someday. <laughs> okay, so soil fungus, there's ten times the weight of fungus in your topsoil than there is bacteria, and we're going to start with that, and we're going to start with mushrooms. So here we have a gilled mushroom. In the bottom of the mushroom, you have all these gills, and those gills are loaded with spores, the little baby spores, little single-cell critters, each one capable of creating another mushroom at some point. So the mushroom then blows off those spores, and they land, and the spores start to reproduce. And so as they reproduce, they reproduce, reproduce, they form these little white strands called hypha. And these are the little white strands that you see in the soil when you get under the oak leaves, when you get into the compost piles. And as the hypha becomes stronger, they form what's called mycelium. That's the word that you need to remember, mycelium. And so the mycelium now keeps reproducing. And you'll see this white strand effect, the white spaghetti, all through the forest. 
all through root structures, etc. And this is called mycelium. You can see here the little bit, the, this has been a poorly picked mushroom, but you see a little bit of mycelium on the bottom of that. Under that mushroom, that mycelium is going to go out maybe for 100 yards. Who knows how far? And mycelium, which is, again, the fungus, the fungus, as it travels through the soil, picks up all kinds of nutrients because ultimately it's going to bring back all those trace elements and all those nutrients back into the plants. So it goes way far away from plants and gathers up all kinds of stuff. It's like hunters. And they go out and they find things. They bring them back to mama. So you have now mats of mycelium all through the forest. When you step into the forest, you step on a mycelial mat. Guess who it communicates with? The whole forest. The whole forest knows you're there. So don't try any funny stuff. <laughs> As the mycelium becomes stronger now, it gets strong enough to reproduce. And what does it turn into? turns into a mushroom bud, which turns into a new mushroom. So all a mushroom is, is concentrated mycelium. It's nothing fancy. It's just mycelium, which then creates this little gill structure. The spores come, and they disperse, and everybody's happy again. So the fungus keeps going and going. So here's the fun part. So the fingertips of the mycelium the little tea guys, just like the little microvilli fingers and the fingers of villi, now go in search of a plant root. And on the left, we have a radish seed. How many miles of root hairs on this radish seed? 10 to 12 miles. Cabbage seed on the right has about 14 miles. Okay. Root hairs of a carrot go down about 8 feet. They're tiny. Grapes go down 50 feet. Alfalfa supposedly goes down 150 feet, which is why it's one of the strongest of all the, the plants for animals, because it picks up more trace elements as the root hairs go deeper. So the exciting thing is now that the mycelium finds a root hair, finds a root hair cell, and penetrates it. So now that mycelium goes into the root hair and establishes contact, and guess what? secretes everything that plant needs in perfect chelated form. That is mother's milk to the plant. And everything that you do with organic gardening, what, no matter what your theories, this is where the rubber hits the road. It is this connection of the root hair cell to the mycelium. All right? That combination is called mycorrhiza. And that's one of the most important words. You should memorize that and tattoo it somewhere on your body. <laughs> Mycorrhiza. So that is the union. All right? It's the same as the union of the intestinal bacteria with your microvilli. Very important. So here you can see total microscopic stuff here. You can see the little strands of mycelium coming into the root hair and feeding. The plant trades back a certain amount of carbohydrates, a certain things that the fungus need for its survival. And then the root hair dies, and the death of that creates more food for the root hair cell. So the plant gets perfect nutrition. What happens when you hurt mycorrhiza? What happens when you hurt soil mycelium? What is acid rain doing to trees? Why in the east do the forests start to die? because the acid rain kills the mycelium, so it can't create the mycorrhiza. Chemical fertilizers, et cetera, when you look at the bottom line, it's hurting the mycelium. You're killing soil fungus. You're taking an antibiotic and killing it, OK? So if you're an organic gardener, the only thing you care about is mycorrhiza. The rest is fluff. So the question is, what will feed the mycorrhiza? What will make the soil fungus happy? In the same way, that you are healthy according to how you feed your gut flora. If you have no respect for your gut flora, guess what? They will bring in their bad buddies and they'll kick your butt. So when you're eating, you're going to feed your bowel bacteria. If you're going to put something in your compost, you want it to be biodegradable. You're not going to put gasoline into your compost pile because what's that do to the critters? It takes a lot of their energy to get rid of the stuff before they can get healthy again. Same with your gut. If you're going to put something into your gut, like an aspartame, 
an MSG, a hydrogenated oil, what's that do to your gut flora? It's quite distractive and dangerous. And your vitality is totally tied in to your connection of your villi, microvilli, and your gut flora. Same in the soil. Here we have more connections of mycorrhiza. And 90% of all the plants in the world have some form of mycorrhiza. Tell me what they are again, Dale. It's the soil fungus, the white strands. That's the, That's the mycelium. That's the mycelium. The mycelium join up to the root hair cell. Then they connect. I look at it as like a big tanker plane in the sky fueling a jet fighter. See, it has a big old tube that comes down that feeds the jet fighter. That's what mycorrhizae is. But in this case, it's perfectly proportioned. So if the plant needs copper, the mycelium go off and they find copper and it's translated back into the plant. If they're iron deficient, they'll go out and find it. Between the plant and the soil fungus. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, they're talking. Yeah, they got a menu, and I think they have a jute box. I'm not sure. Yeah. So here's just a picture of a mushroom, Amanita in this case putting off mycelium, the mycelium are going into the root hair cells of the pine tree. This is going to be a healthier pine tree. When the plant loses its connection to soil fungus, it's just as if it's a human with two months of antibiotics. You turn the, r the rainforest into a desert. That's what you do with soil. And that's what's happening now. But don't just think of poisons and things. Think of the bottom line, which is mycorrhiza. So you know from now on, whenever there's a problem, it's a problem with the mycorrhiza. If a plant is diseased, if it's turning yellow, you can't just say, well, it has too much nitrogen, it has too much potash, blah, blah, blah. It's hurting the mycelium. That's what's hurting the plant. Does the pH balance of the water or anything have, have any effect on the If it has an effect on mycorrhiza, it will. If it's also an but it's the microbes that do it. Just like in your stomach. If you do sauerkraut, sauerkraut, the microbes of sauerkraut, if you're too acidic in your stomach, it will neutralize you. And if you're too alkaline, it will neutralize you. See, it's a miracle food. Go ahead. To a certain extent, but you still can create mycorrhizae most anywhere. But if in doubt, see, you're gonna put stuff in. You're gonna make your manure tea you're going to put it in there. You're going to feed microbes to your soil, because what you're doing is you're feeding microbes, which will then feed your plant. Don't think that whenever you put a commercial fertilizer or something that's not broken down onto your garden or onto your raised bed or into your grower pot, that the plant can use it. The plant cannot use it until it's broken down properly by the soil fungus. They will then feed the plant. When you're fertilizing your garden, you're not fertilizing the plants. Get out of that idea. You're feeding the soil microbes. They know what to do. When you feed yourself, you're feeding your soil microbes. You're just an addendum. See? The Jews know that. They're food traditions. See, They'll have certain sequences of food. They'll have their pickled herring. They'll have their chopped liver with, with different ferments. They'll have gefilte fish, but they're doing ferments. All your healthy societies do ferments in their diet. What do we do in our diet? All dead food. What is the uh, gets mostly carbohydrates and some other things. No, yeah, and I don't mean to insinuate that. So, the, but it's the most important part. You have thousands and thousands of different microbes in the soil. Yeah. So we should make that specific to mycorrhizal forming fungi. <laughs> yes, everybody eats everybody. There's it's an ocean where the bigger fish are eating. And there's still good fungi, but they're not mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yes. They're decomposers. They're doing other lovely things there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's clear? Here you just have a couple examples of mycorrhiza grown produce compared to non. And so what I'm trying to get at in this lecture in a half an hour is that health is dependent upon three fingers. Number one, the intersection of the villi with the bowel bacteria. Number two is going to be the mycorrhizal relationship with the plant root hair cell. And number, th number three is a little bit more abstract, and this is going to be the connection that you have with your energy source, whatever your source of divinity is, your source of guidance in the universe, and that is also a finger. So these are your three fingers, and if you keep these in mind, when you eat, you're feeding your bowel bacteria. When you garden, you're feeding your soil mycorrhiza and your soil microbes. They'll take care of business. And then if you want to be happy, healthy, and holy, you have to have some concept of your life where you have some importance and that what you do is important. So that's all I know. So questions? And sales pitch, I have some books over here. They're cheap and they have all kinds of essays. This is much more elaborated in the book in the soil sections. I go through earthworms and composting and how to and breakdowns and mycelium and mycorrhiza. So all that stuff is in there. Essays on, bowel, on cholesterol, why you should eat a lot of it. Um, soy, why you should stay away from it unless it's fermented. Um, sugars, so there's all kinds of essays on all kinds of things in there, essays on depression. And so take a look at that. Um, I have some um, essays that are singular there too. They're free, but if you want to donate, that's fine to pay for some of the cost of them. And at some point here, possibly in February, we're going to be doing probably a gut lecture at my house. We have a classroom where we give seminars, and if anybody's interested, talk to Diane or Anya. Okay, questions? So in regards to touching back to that thing, you kind of vaguely said because it didn't sound like there's enough study as No, I read it somewhere, but I don't know what and I don't know what it was about. But I remember I just remember in my mind that said 150 feet and I was very impressed with that. But I don't know the source and how true it is. I was gonna say because everybody's into this microgreens and whatnot, and then alpha being one of them, and then if that's the case, the root system is really Yeah. Yeah, the plant is dependent upon whatever nutrients are in that soil. And the soil microbes will break down better what's there. But if you have an oak tree where you have a huge 100-yard radius around it, then the root hairs will go out to find things, and the mycelium will come and find the root hairs. So you have this incredible combination. Um, if you look at the soil a couple of months of antibiotics or prednisone, how um, likely are you, I mean, how much damage have you done to those little things and how likely are you to be able to bring them back? Sometimes it takes a long time to bring them back. But you can? You mm -hmm. can to a great extent. With autistic kids, now they've shown, they've taken kids with autism that were around 10 years old and they've totally got rid of the autism, it took two years. And they were on what's called the GAPS diet. Um, I have comments on that in the book, uh, Natasha McBride chapter. Um, but you can build back most things, but you have to <coughs> do your, most patients I try to get them to do a month of two cups a day of a ferment, just for openers. So they, every day they do yogurt, they do sauerkraut, they do kefir, they do kimchi, they do something and they keep rebuilding their population. So they're planting a new rainforest and then everybody's happy again. But most things you can get rid of. There's a few things um, that are very tough. Um, ulcerative colitis is a big one now. It's once you have significant ulcerative colitis, you die. Guess what the new treatment is for ulcerative colitis? Because the antibiotics didn't work and they had to remove the gut, and now they have a new special deal. They take fecal matter from a relative or a wife, and they intubate it into the gut through the butt or through the mouth. And guess what? Two days later, the guy's symptoms are totally different. And it's like 94% totally 
viable now. So they're doing that as a procedure. Who's and what, so that? when you look at the, what's happening with that, all they're doing is replacing bowel bacteria with good bacteria. Why do yeah. dogs go out and eat other dogs' poop? They have to have the microbes. They're being fed soy and a bunch of grains, and they have no gut flora. Animals need flora. Actually, in the back first. Worm castings and use your compost tea. Compost tea is actually better than manure tea, believe it or not, because it's already pre-digested. So don't, don't snicker at compost tea. Get your finished humus, your compost, put that into your five gallons of water, soak it for a couple of days, sprinkle that on all your gardens and plants. You're, you're putting microbes. Same with your compost piles. If you want to speed up your compost pile, just put more microbes on. Yeah, aerating speed things up. If you got time, you don't actually have to aerate it, but it does speed up the process. Do you recommend probiotic supplements, and how do you know which ones are good? <laughs> I think we'll just keep talking until we're interrupted. Um, is, there, is there another speaker here that's supposed to speak at nine ten. or ten? Yeah. Are they here? Because I can babble away, but if I, we're holding someone up, we'll go outside and talk. Okay. Okay. So probiotics are extremely valuable. The concerns with probiotics is that you'll buy a bottle that says three billion per milliliter or whatever. Guess what they count? They count everything, and half the bacteria are dead. So everything that's there is counted. Most bacteria and probiotics are raised on the wrong medium. They're raised on soy. They're raised on garbanzo bean medium. Guess what doesn't have complete protein and all the elements it needs, those things. So when you raise a bacteria in milk or a cabbage medium, et cetera, you're getting way more nutrition to that bacteria. You don't know. And I, I have one line that I carry in my office, and that's, I do that based upon Natasha McBride's recommendation. She's been around, so I accept her recommendation, but I don't know. And I try to get people to do it through a food rather than with a pill. Mm -hmm. if, if you can get a hold of the people that make it, then you can ask intelligent questions, then you can find out. Yeah. And if they're honest, they'll even tell you. <laughs> well, you, know, you can say, you know, I'm concerned about how this is made. Can you tell me? You don't have to tell them that you're looking for something that's made a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more, then we'll hit the big highway. Um, she was actually in front of you, unfortunately, but talk to me after. That's easy. We've, I've done this for 30 years, and people have gotten rid of all kinds of things just with changing their flora. And that means half the stuff that's autoimmune. So the severity of your lupuses even, your migraines, a lot of your migraines are autoimmune. So you just change the gut and the guy stops having the migraines. So there's all kinds of things that go along with the gut. Your general first track in your health is your gut flora. So when you look at an illness, if you, what is flu? What is a common cold? See, it's just a reaction in your gut flora. What is being drunk after drinking alcohol? or getting a headache from a sulfite. See, it's all from the gut. It's all mediated by your gut flora. Your gut flora, tell everybody else what to do. Yeah, second brain. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Buy at least five copies, and any questions, you can tell me after. Good.